This is many people's favorite sound in the morning. The sound of a fresh cup of coffee being made, the aromas wafting through the air at the start of the day. Coffee has been a big part of our daily lives for hundreds of years now. It started out as a delicacy only in certain parts of the world, then quickly spread around the globe. Now, many people plan their mornings around it and sometimes even their afternoons for that midday slump. We have endless options of how to drink it, iced, hot, with milk, what kind of milk, sugar or no sugar, foam on top or no foam, decaf, flavors and syrups, etc. And don't even get me started on all the different machines and tools there are for making a good coffee. The smell of it alone is enough to drive you crazy with caffeine cravings, and there's something really cozy about the ambiance of a coffee shop, with the sounds of steaming milk, grinding coffee, and the chatter of nearby strangers chatting, reading, or typing away on their laptops. For something so ubiquitous in our life, I bet not many of us stop to think about where this coffee grew. Surprisingly, volcanoes are actually a pretty big part of the equation. Let me tell you how. So first and foremost, a little overview and a short history of coffee. So the coffee plant is part of the genus Caffea, and within that genus there are many different species. Online I read that there is a debate as to how many species there actually are, but this ranges from 25 to over 100 species. And out of those species, there are only about three that we use for the coffee drink. So the coffee that I'm drinking now from Starbucks is an Arabica coffee. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Arabica? Arabica? I should probably look that up. Arabica. Okay, Arabica, I was saying that wrong. <laughs> Arabica is actually the species that most of the coffee in the world comes from. So when you're drinking your latte or your espresso or you go to the gas station, that is probably an Arabica coffee. Sometimes it will be another species called Canifora, also called Robusta. And this one is more used, I think, in like instant coffees and it doesn't have as much of a flavor to it, but it's also more disease resistant. So there's pros and cons to these different species. So so within one species, there are many different varieties, and when we talk about coffee varieties, all the different tastes and all the different kinds of plants, we're talking about the different strains or varieties of it. Just like how there are many different varieties of tomatoes, we can see different colors, different shapes, different tastes, and different plant shapes and morphology. So just keep that in mind, it's just like another plant or fruit. The coffee plant originated in Ethiopia, and this is where the plant diversified into thousands of different varieties. From here, the coffee plant was actually transported by humans intentionally and planted intentionally in the 1300s, and from here it was transported to Yemen. From there, the Dutch actually stole some of these plants and they used their um, international trade routes to spread it to other places. For example, Java, a small island in Indonesia. In 1714, the Dutch also gifted a coffee plant to King Louis XIV because he loved coffee so much. This tree was called the noble tree or the royal tree and cuttings were actually taken from this plant, this one plant, and spread around the world to grow more coffee. And this tree is actually the common ancestor of most coffee varieties that we drink today and that we grow around the world. There's a lot more to the story and it involves a lot of hybridization of different coffee plants depending on the productivity of the plant, the disease resistance, and also the flavor, of course. The societal and economic importance and history of coffee is extremely complicated and interesting, so I suggest after this video you go and read and learn a little bit more about it in detail. So what exactly is a coffee plant? Is it a tree? Is it a shrub? Is it a vine? It can actually be a tree or a shrub depending on the species and the variety. The coffee plants themselves have a wide range of appearances from their leaves to their branches and of course to their berries. Yes, I said berries, not beans. The coffee beans that we know of are actually not beans. They're more like seeds or pits. They come from inside of a berry called a cherry and this berry has usually two seeds inside of it. They actually start out as a light green color and they are isolated from the cherry in different ways. The way that the seeds are separated from the cherries actually has a huge difference on what the flavor is like of the coffee. Once the seeds are isolated from the cherries, they are then cleaned and roasted. And this is where it becomes a little more familiar to us. This is where it turns into that brown coffee bean that we're so used to seeing. So let's take a look at where coffee is actually grown on the globe. The coffee belt is an imaginary belt on the globe and it ranges from the Tropic of Cancer to Capricorn. I don't know which one is which so I may have done 
motioning wrong, but essentially it's about 25-ish degrees north or south of the equator. And these are the places where you see a tropical or a semi-tropical climate. Some of the most valued countries for growing coffee are Ethiopia, Guatemala, Colombia, Costa Rica, Indonesia, and many more. And if you look at these countries, you'll see they are all in this belt. So it's not just as simple as coffee can grow anywhere in this belt. Technically, the Robusta, the Canifora species, can grow in a lot more places that Arabica can't. And this is because Arabica is a lot more picky as to where it roots itself. Robusta is a lot more disease resistant and it can also survive at lower altitudes and it doesn't necessarily need that great rich volcanic soil as much as the Arabica coffee plant does. So what is it about the climate, about these locations that coffee actually thrives on? What does coffee need to grow? One of the major factors is elevation. Coffee grown at higher elevations tend to have a bit more of an acidic and strong taste to it. This is why the coffees grown at higher elevations tend to be more valued and more award-winning. So another thing is climate. And the reason that coffee does so well in these tropical or semi-tropical climates is because of the moisture needs and the temperature needs of the plant. Just like all plants, they have different preferences and needs biologically for how they grow. In these tropical and semi-tropical climates there is enough moisture and precipitation with warm enough temperatures but there's also some drier and warmer seasons that the coffee plant tends to do pretty well in. And another huge factor is the soil. The soil is pretty much the terroir of the coffee plant. Just like how a wine connoisseur can drink a glass of wine and know exactly what region it was grown in, a coffee connoisseur can take a sip of coffee and know exactly what region and what kind of soil that coffee bean was grown in. There are a few major characteristics of the soil that a coffee plant needs in order to thrive there. The roots don't do well when they're waterlogged, so the water has to drain pretty quickly through that soil. And then there also has to be a pH of about 5.3 to 6. There has to be enough of a presence of nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, elements like boron, zinc, magnesium, iron, and other things. The soils that work well for this are sandy loams and of course volcanic soils. Sandy loam is essentially just a soil that's a mix of sand, silt, and clay with a little bit more of a sandy proportion. This usually works well for the drainage because there's just enough sand for that water to percolate in between and then there's still enough silt and clay for it to be cohesive enough so that it doesn't erode. Most soils that fit these requirements are called andesols. One of the components that qualifies a soil as an andesol is that it has to have a good amount of volcanic glass in it. And one of the main components of volcanic ash or tephra is volcanic glass. Volcanic glass is essentially just magma that cooled really quickly when it reached the surface, so when the volcano exploded, and it didn't have time to crystallize into specific minerals. So it doesn't have a crystal composition like rocks usually do. Andesols are soils that are old enough to have been weathered down into a rich soil from that original parent material, the lava rock and all the ash, but they're not old enough to have had all of those elements leached away from it as many other soils may have been. So a soil in an area like where I'm sitting, in a forested area, in a... There's a bug flying around like it's drunk right now. For example, where I'm sitting here, I'm in a forested area in the state of New York and I'm nowhere near the equator. There's different seasons here. We get snow, there's fall, there's humidity and warmer temperatures in the summer with rain, and there's a decent amount of sunlight throughout the year. The soils in this area are classified as alpha sols and other soils in my area can also be inceptosols. The soils here have had more time to mature and the elements that were in the parent material have now been weathered away, partially at least. Andesols only cover about 1% of the Earth's ice-free land surface. In comparison, alpha-sols, the soils right here, cover about 10% of the Earth's surface, and inceptosols, the other soil type I mentioned in this area, cover about 15%. So this is a pretty narrowed down area of the world where these coffee beans can thrive and grow and create really great tasting coffee. So since there are different types of volcanic eruptions with different magma compositions, we get different kinds of minerals that show up in this ash. This can include quartz, feldspar, amphiboles, pyroxene, olivine, as well as micas. The climate of these regions also has a big effect on how the ash and the rocks break down into soil. So the soil in one region can have pretty much the identical volcanic 
composition as another region, but the climate that it's in can make the soil completely different and therefore the coffee beans that grow from that soil can have a completely different taste. This rock is so uncomfortable to sit on. There are many different factors that go into the formation of soils, especially andesols, which is why andesols are not all the same everywhere. This is why we have so many different coffee varieties and why there's so many different tastes and aromas to each coffee. So now let's go back to that map of the coffee belt that I showed you earlier, and let's compare it to a map of the world's volcanoes. Do you see any similarities? It's pretty obvious that this is in big part to the andesols that I just spent forever talking about, but there are actually a few other aspects of volcanic areas that really help coffee plants thrive even more other than the soil. One of these is the altitude. Volcanoes are mountains, so the elevation is obviously higher in these regions. And like I said, coffee needs pretty high elevation for there to be that really good flavor to it. Going along with the fact that volcanoes are mountains, they also help provide shade for the coffee plants. This helps the cherries slowly ripen and this can really help the flavor of the coffee beans in the long run. Ash is also very acidic, which I didn't mention before, and this helps contribute to the higher level of acidity in the soils. These soils are slightly more acidic than other soils like the ones I'm near right now, and this is what coffee likes. Okay, so we've established that volcanic soil is ideal for growing coffee. So does that mean that any volcano that is in the coffee belt is automatically perfect for growing coffee? Not necessarily. The different types of magma and tectonic settings create different types of eruptions. There can be an effusive eruption or an explosive eruption. An effusive eruption is pretty much the opposite of an explosive eruption. This is the type of eruption we're seeing right now in Iceland where the lava is just kind of seeping out of the fissures and it doesn't really have any violence to it. There isn't a lot of ash and gas and sometimes volcanoes can have a mix of these two types of eruptions, much like Mount Etna in Italy, which is also currently erupting. Hawaii is another example of somewhere that usually has effusive eruptions because the lava has a really low viscosity and it moves really fast. So we have different types of magma. There's mafic, felsic, and andesitic. Andesitic is in between mafic and felsic, and one of the major ingredients of magma is silica. Even the most mafic magmas where there's the least amount of silica, there's still still over 50% silica in it. So essentially, mafic magma has the least amount of silica, but the most amount of elements like iron, magnesium, and calcium. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have felsic magma, which has high amounts of silica and low amounts of magnesium, iron, and calcium. The more silica there is in a magma, the more viscous it is, and usually the more explosive the eruption. In between these two, we have intermediate, and this can also cause very explosive eruptions as well. The tectonic settings that tend to have the most explosive eruptions are subduction zones. That is the oceanic plate subducting under the continental plate. So the eruptions that make the best soil for coffee to grow in are actually the ones that spew a lot of ash and rock fragments into the air. These are eventually settled onto the ground and they are incorporated and broken down into the soil. So there are actually a lot of risks to growing coffee in a lot of these regions because not only is it dangerous for humans to live so close to an active volcano, but there's also a risk that the coffee plants can be ruined by the ash falling on them and breaking the branches, or the acid rain that can come after an eruption and kind of just ruin those coffee plants. There's always this risk. So that's all I have for today's topic. I hope that this was interesting for you and that you have a little bit more of an appreciation now for coffee and for volcanoes as well. I hope you learned something and thanks for watching.